What's up, everyone? I'm Justin, the Star Wars Marvel purist, and today we are going to talk about the 90s era X-Men. The early 90s would mark a passing of the baton and what many would think an impossible task. After an influx of new artists and writers like Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld, among others, Chris Claremont found himself at ends with the editor-in-chief of uh, X-Men back then, which was Bob Harris. Uh, enter writers Fabian Nicesa and Scott Lobdale. Uh, Fabian Nicesa was paired up with Liefeld and helped create X-Force, Deadpool, and Shatterstar in 1991 and the final three issues of New Mutants. Uh, when Claremont left after quote-unquote creative differences with Harris, uh, John Byrne and Jim Lee would take over and write issues four and five of X-Men Volume 2. Uh, Scott Lobdell and Jim Lee would then write issues um, uh, six through 11. After Claremont's departure, it would only be 11 issues later that Jim Lee, Liefeld, and all those others that came and kind of not bullied or pushed them out, but they were the new blood. So that's why Harris and all the Marvel side was kind of taking their side because they're like the new energetic guys and all that. They all they all they all took off and and founded Image with uh, Todd McFarlane, which is fine, good on them. But yeah, it's kind of a shame that. Claremont kind of got pushed out, then they came, and then they all kind of left. Uh, when Liefeld left to go to Image, uh, Fabian Nicesa became the full-time writer for X-Force, issues 12 through 43. Uh, he was already, like, the scripter for the first 11 issues anyway, so, like, Liefeld was writing shit with him, but I'm sure he's probably pretty much headlining, you know, what, what the what the stuff was. It was Liefeld, you know, basically doing the art. Uh, Nicesa also had the impossible task of taking over as writer of the X-Men Volume 2, starting with issue 12 after Claremont left after issue three and, uh, you know, the others had kind of filled in the gaps. And then what they did is they moved Lobdell over to uh, Uncanny X-Men, um, the Un Uncanny X-Men book, while Nicesa took over the the new X-Men book. Uh, Fabian Nicesa also had experience with large crossovers like Operation Galactic Stormfront, uh, which he was the actual head editor for. Like, he was kind of like the, the story runner for that one. Um I think I kind of talked it in, about it in passing when I was talking about the Marvels movie. Uh, that's basically like it's a battle between the Shi'ar Empire and the freaking Kree. Um, and actually that, that whole character that they use in the Marvels, Dar Ben, who's actually a male in the comics, Dar Ben's killed by Deathbird, uh, which is the, um, she's the evil sister of Lalandra from the Shi'ar Empire. Um, and then crossovers kind of became like a huge thing in the 90s anyways. Like I said, Fabian kind of had experience with doing them. Um, some people kind of argue that's the downfall and, and what kind of burst the comic book bubble. Uh, mostly I think people because of like the new influx of characters and the oversaturation type stuff. But again, that that's kind of another, that's it's oversaturation. It's kind of like, oh, uh, car, uh, Marvel movie fatigue or comic book fatigue. Like I don't really think that exists because... Um, you know, the, if you, if you do the right storylines and the good stories, that's, that's what got this book up to freaking 8.3 million or 8.2 million people buying issue one of volume two and 5 million people buying X-Force number one. You know, it's because it was built up, um, you know, equity, you know, through the fan base of what, how great these stories were. It wasn't because they sucked and people got bored of them. No, people were flocking to it and adding to the numbers. So personally, I don't think that was the problem, but you know, what do I know? Like most things, I think Marvel got too big and bloated, and comics became, you know, too corporatized, which is what we're seeing right now on the on the movie side. You know, I, I think that's definitely uh, a big thing. Um, I've heard from a lot of people uh, in or kind of familiar with the industry as well that Bob Harris becoming the X Men uh, editor in chief was a big part of the problem. And although like the books kept selling, most of that is probably due to the longtime fans like us Gen Xers, uh, collectors, uh, influx of like the new fans from the animated series and the popularity that the series, that the books got from that. Um, supposedly, I just recently heard this, uh, Fabian Aceza is on record as saying that rarely did any of his scripts actually make it completely past editing the way that they began. So basically, Harris was fucking changing shit left and right. Uh, and this guy kind of built up a reputation through all of Marvel, uh, kind of akin to what the MCU is now or what the, mo the modern comic industry became, became. And that is doing the quick and easy for a quick profit while simultaneously reducing the quality of the product and the overall long-term plan. Uh, allegedly, he used this strategy like through his climb up through the Marvel ranks, and eventually it landed him as the head Marvel editor-in-chief. 
you know, basically run the show uh, from 95 to 2000. This was during the bankruptcy, like when they were going to file bankruptcy and they were selling off the Fantastic Four to Fox and and the X-Men to Fox and Spider-Man to Sony and all that. That was uh, probably, you know, a lot due to this dude. Uh, regardless of how we got there, uh, there's no doubt the 90s marks not only the peak, but also the decline of the X-Men books. Um <clears throat> And, you know, again, there's no doubt, um, there's, there's, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly, you know, when it happened, you know, obviously it's based off taste and stuff too, but there's no doubt that similar to the MCU, the X titles uh, had a lot of carryover equity accumulated through the Claremont days, uh, and from love from the show. Uh, so a lot of people I know, like myself, I personally like a lot of the stories that Fabian Nicesa did and Scott Lobdell did uh, in the early to mid 90s. Um, I, I think Nicesa is the one who did like the whole Psylocke transporting her essence into Quanon, which was the hand assassin um, and, and, and then her being reprogrammed by the hand or whatever. It's like the complicated as shit but it was cool uh they also did like the executioner song uh which is a you know crossover with uh you know cable and strife uh, i love that dude that was like great stuff for me back in the day um and and, and all this other good stuff um and then i think age of the apocalypse i think kind of marks like the common consensus storyline that kind of served as the end of the good days and probably one of the last great and remembered runs and, and and people have different opinions on it i think everybody can pull there was some really good plots and sub stories in in the freaking age of apocalypse if even if you didn't like the whole story as a whole i think there's lots of um certain story beats and and, and whatnot that really i think a lot of people liked uh, but apart from lobdell and the Seza, nobody to me has really carried over the essence of the original chris claremont characters uh, they were handed uh, we can explore this at another time, but I mean, to me, I just, I just don't see it. I think, uh, I think they kind of like spelled the end at that point. Like everybody else that's wanted to put their spin on it. And this is their version of the X-Men and all that. And I feel like Nicesa and Lobdell kind of wanted to carry over, you know, and like I said, a passing of the baton to them from Claremont instead of just upend it and change it, uh, which is, you know, where we're at now.